This test program included the building and testing of a number of one-eighth scale free flight models to obtain drag and stability information. The models carried telemetering equipment to transmit signals to ground stations while the model was in free flight. Each model was attached to a Nike rocket booster. During each flight, the airborne transmitter sent a continuous stream of information on the flight characteristics of the model to the ground stations. Additional information was gathered by Kinney theodolite cameras and by radar, which tracked each flight. All this data was recorded and analyzed to ensure that the arrow design was proceeding on the right lines. Testing proved the validity of design. Production tooling was started with the building of these master models. They are the basic forming tools for contour accuracy of skinned sections. Building a first aircraft using complete production tooling eliminates delay when quantity production is required. This new approach to aircraft production has proved most successful and is being widely adopted in the production of other high-performance aircraft. As the thousands of drawings of tested, proven design were released for manufacture, the tempo of production quickened. Supersonic aircraft are virtually flying pressure vessels, and as such, the complete aircraft structure is subject to wide variations of pressure. This fact greatly influenced the design of the structure. The effect of aerodynamic heating at supersonic speeds has also been an important factor in the design of the aircraft. Although the extent of this heating is not so great as to make it impossible to use aluminum alloys, new alloys were used where practical to improve the performance and safety of the aircraft. For example, the large surface area and relatively low loading of the fuselage allowed the advantageous use of magnesium alloys, particularly those with good high temperature properties. Because of its proven reliability, the J75 engine was a logical choice for installation in an untried aircraft. However, when the Orenda Iroquois is installed, the full potential of the arrow will come much closer to realization. Across the country, hundreds of associate contractors and suppliers providing equipment for the arrow were making their contribution to its success. Each had a specified job to perform, and each had a delivery deadline to meet. All these operations had to mesh with the master schedule the key plan for the production of the arrow. Inevitably, in a project of this magnitude, there were some snags. There were occasional delays and sometimes adjustments had to be made to keep the whole project rolling smoothly. But the problems were solved. The difficulties were ironed out. And by the late summer of 1957, the first aircraft neared the end of the production line. From the production line, the first arrow was taken to the flight test hangar. Preparation for flight included exhaustive testing of the aircraft systems and ground running of the engines.
Following completion of these tests, the aircraft began its taxi trials with Avro's chief experimental pilot, Jan Zurakowski, at the controls. During a series of low and high-speed taxi runs, he was able to familiarize himself with the taxiing characteristics of the Arrow and to check the operation of the wheel brakes, the drag chute, and various related systems. Finally, on the morning of March 25, 1958, the Arrow is ready for the air. At 14 points around the airfield, motion picture and still cameras are stationed to cover takeoff and landing. As Jan Zurakowski climbs into the cockpit, 10,000 Avro employees and RCAF observers watch tensely from the edge of the airfield. Ground telemetry units stand by to record data transmitted from the aircraft. CF-100 and Sabre chase planes take off for visual and photographic observation of the flight. And in the Avro Tower, recordings are made of all verbal communications. Thank you. 